That's right, huh? Good morning, Jeremy. Hello, everybody. I'm not hearing anybody. Is anybody hearing me? Uh, yes, oh, no, we can hear you. Cool. How are you doing? Good. Doing good. It's a good day. I'm here. Hi, Marty. I think How are you're you a new me? face, right? What's that? I think you're a new face, right? I, I am newer, yes. I, I've been on actually all the um all of them, but I just uh don't speak a whole lot. I see. Nice to see you. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Getting a bit bright. I might close this. <laughs> Is it raining there, Jeremy? Nope, it's nice and sunny. No. It's normally pretty much always sunny here in during winter, nearly always. It's, good, it's our best season. My windows organized. Hi, Radic, how are you? Hey, I'm good. How about yourself? Pretty good. Oh, I read the blog post yesterday by. Uh, you know, Isaac, the Which, one about the, the dot product? operator. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wow, what a mind bender. <laughs> that was <laughs> uh, pretty cool. I very I guess very I should, cool. I guess I should share that so people can see what you're talking about. Uh, yeah, and <clears> so <throat> I, I read it yesterday before going to sleep. And today I, I, I took another look. It, it will take me a, a few more attempts probably to fully like understand what's going on there. I, I probably need to play with the dot operator because it's, uh, yeah, it is so interesting. It's like, uh, like, <laughs> how does it yeah, know? I, I, <laughs> how does I didn't it understand know? it until I finished writing the post myself. So it was... <laughs> <laughs> you know, how does it know to broadcast the, uh, because that's what it essentially does. I, I guess it broke, broadcasts the, um, here it's just a vector, right? The, the, the second, uh, I'm not sure what, what words to use because it's, I guess the, the, the first thing is a, is an, a matrix, right? We, we, I mean, maybe go up a level. I mean, Isaac, yeah. maybe you can give us a quick overview, like maybe you share your screen or something and give us a quick picture of, what you found, and then see if we can answer um, Radek's question. Because I really like the inner product operator in APL because I think it's a great example of the ways in which APL has a tendency to generalize things beyond the original math notation to make them more expressive, in my opinion. And you're doing the course by Gilbert Strunk. That's uh, quite quite an awesome choice. Yeah, I I, I love that course. Um, it's it's just really good. Um, you know, another course yes. which is great is Fast.ai's uh, numerical linear algebra course. If I well, yeah, I, 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 I was that. even <laughs> I, I was even thinking uh, like yesterday that. It might be fun to do the course, but do the exercises in APL. Oh, yeah. That would uh, actually be very uh, you know, interesting. For that course. Yep. So um, 
let's skip ahead a little bit, but to talk about really what the dot does. Um, this was the clearest so here we have uh this matrix times this matrix two five one three eight times uh, one two three four and so we're going to multiply these together and you can't oh. use the dot by itself because it has to have functions on either side of them um but if you could use the dot by itself um this is what it would do um it would it gives you the structure of this problem so that it's going to kind of lay it out in this way. Um, it's going to lay your problem out here. And you can see, you know, your one, two, three, four, and your one, two, three, four, it's all multiplying it. Um, and it's going to take these, I guess, are these called double alpha and double omega? I, I mm -hmm. guess I don't know. Um, but it's going to take whatever's on the left and the right of the dot and apply those functions in this way. So I, I kind of think of the, the inner product operator is it just sets the framework for the problem and then drops, in this case, the, the plus and the times uh, functions into these particular spots. So for example, and double so, omega will often be times and double alpha will often be plus. And if you do it in that way, uh, then it's matrix multiplication. I could swear that yesterday it was a different example of a matrix and a vector, and now yes. it's a matrix times a, ma a, ma a matrix. Oh yeah, it, I got a question, I, so I added I added a section. Sorry about that. Yeah, I got a question, so I added oh. a section. And it's the same. It's the same idea here. Um, uh -huh. We do in this case when we're doing a matrix, this matrix times the vector, uh, we get the exact same structure of the problem, um, but they're all scalars because we only have one number multiplied by another. Um, in this case, it's the double omega multiplication. It's one times two plus two times five, one times one plus two times three. And so we get we get it in that way. If we were to, to do the same thing, right? If uh, one of these, uh, the second one was a matrix, if instead of, you know, our one, two vector, we had a, um, one, two, three, four matrix, instead of this one, two being just numbers, these could be vectors. But we'd still do the same thing. This one could be a vector one, two, three, four, which would use whatever this double omega operator is, um, in this case, times, and multiply it by this two. So this could be a, a scalar in, the, in this example. In a matrix example, it's a vector. Um, I haven't tried it, but I suspect um, kind of as you get into more and more dimensions, it could be, um, you know, higher dimensional arrays as well. Oh, that's, the, the, yeah, that, that's so crazy. So actually, like... you know, I think what we should do maybe today is learn about operators because um, uh, dot is not a function. It's an operator. Um, and this is uh, APL terminology for what in some languages we would call higher order functions. They're functions that take a function and return a function. So in Python, we don't give them a special name. You can have functions that take a function and return a function. Although there is special syntax for doing it more conveniently and that syntax is called decorator syntax, which is where you can pop an at sign um, uh, before a function before a decorator name and put that at the top of a function and that will cause a function to get passed in. In fact, should we look at that first maybe? Um, that might be interesting and then talk about operators. Yeah, sounds great. Okay, let's try it. Because I know uh, Zach Viola did a thing about decorators the other day, which I think people found interesting. Um, so, I guess I should do a git pull first. And while we're there, I guess we should also just talk about other things that have been happening on the forum. Um, actually, it's getting quite active, which is amazing. Um, so one particularly interesting thing, which was also Isaac, 
uh, is a way to create flashcards more conveniently. Um, so if you look for Anki deck generator, you will find that. Um, by the way, these um, these ugly spaces are caused by this. You're not sharing thing. your screen. Oh, I'm not sharing my screen. Of course, I'm not sharing my screen. I never remember to share my screen. There we go. OK, let's try that again. So uh, all right, so this is the Anki deck generator thread um, from Isaac. Um, and so I think now there's what, three different decks you can import, Isaac? Uh, yes. So here's some of those examples. But there will be more. I'm going to be after after each session um, because I don't want to have to um, you know recreate the deck. So after each session, I'm going to create a new a new deck for that day. So um, you so might I not have to import that because um, just, I'm sorry if you already know this, but um, if you import a deck with a name of a deck you already have, then any um, um, cards you already have will not be duplicated. Oh. So you can just keep exporting your updated deck and people can keep importing that and it won't. And as long as you make sure you don't include scheduling information in the exported deck, um, then it'll work fine. Oh, even better. Um, do you think it would be useful for, I didn't know that, but do you think it would be useful for people who maybe aren't in the group and are either trying to catch up or are going to watch this in the future to have kind of one at each day? Not really, because um, there'll be an order, right? I mean, oh, that's true. At at most, I'd say like add a tag to each card to say what session it's from, but otherwise, people will just like they'll be like, oh, I haven't got to this bit yet, so so stop. Yeah, well, so like um, yeah, if you just go file export in Anki, and then you choose deck package. And you choose the package, remove scheduling information, and then you say export. Um, this is what I do for the kids. And um, so that will export the deck. And then when they import it, it'll say these ones already existed and these ones are new, and it'll bring in the new ones. Awesome. So I was just saying earlier that. Um, Thank you, Mark. That's. That's such a cognitive dissonance for me to see Jeremy use a mug. You know, I'm uh, um, yeah, I I've been using Windows largely since 1995, um, and I before that I used quite a mixture. I used Windows 3.0, 3.1, 3.11 1 for work groups, but I also used Mac um, from like. 1990 or so. Um, but I gotta say, Windows 11 is really getting a lot worse. It's the first time like I've really felt like it's getting worse. So for the first time in my life, I'm actually thinking of switching to Mac. Um, and I actually ordered a uh, MacBook Air M2 yesterday. So wow. yeah, you might have to get used <laughs> cool. to it. Um, uh... So yeah, I did. I mean, I do like being able to write on the screen of of, of the Surface Pros and stuff. Um, but what I do instead now is I've got a, a Wacom tablet, which is uh. Bluetooth. And it's actually in some ways like, it's not strictly worse than writing on a screen because I can just, you know, write with it in front of me, whereas with a screen-based approach, I kind of have to move the whole thing. Yes, um, yes. And how are you finding the UI of a market? Is it easy to get used to it? Um, it's all right. I don't, I don't love it. I, um, like, it's definitely much worse than Windows used to be. But Windows is getting, you know, apparently everybody in the um, UX team in Windows all uses Macs, so they seem to be trying to make it more like a Mac. But of course, they don't. They don't really get it, right? So that's the worst of both worlds. Um, so I would say, yeah, I, I kind of like it better than Windows 11. Um, I've realized what I really like actually is um, 
Ubuntu's default desktop environment because that's modeled much more closely on <clears throat> on Windows, you know. Um, like, yeah, Windows keyboard shortcuts just so ubiquitous, for example, mm -hmm. which I really like. Um, and and they are on Ubuntu as well, which I think uses GNOME nowadays. I can't even remember. I just use whatever's there. Um, yeah, so there are things like, for example, to move a, a window in Mac to the other screen. You know, you have to either download an extension to use a keyboard for it, or, you know, like it's all very much assumes mouse stuff. And specifically, a lot of things really assume trackpads. You know, it's a lot of instructions you get will say what to do on a trackpad. Um, anyway, it's okay. You know, like I can like I can hit control left and right to jump to my different virtual desktops, even if I can't move things to different virtual desktops. To do it, like if I want to move this to a different virtual desktop, I can press control up to get, oh, it's on the wrong screen. Uh, oh, this works. I can press control up to bring up mission control and then I can like drag it to the other desktop, which is a bit clunky, but. Yeah. So right. how do you figure out how, how the UI works? Like because I, when that's I that's a great uh, question. I um I, it's not easy, right? Like I, I so part of me kind of thinking maybe I'm giving up on Windows was thinking, okay, well maybe I should act like this literally last weekend I said like, well, okay, I should probably learn to use the Ubuntu desktop environment rather than just doing everything in the terminal. Um so partly it's knowing like what kind of features ought to exist and what they generally get called. So, you know, things like what Mac calls mission control um, is generally called virtual desktops, you know, so learning, so learning how to use virtual desktops properly. I just Googled for Ubuntu virtual desktop and then start, you know, keyboard shortcuts. Um, and I mean, um, they've got some pretty decent documentation. I found so it tells you here. Um, so oh, super yeah. means the Windows key. Uh, so mm -hmm. yeah, Windows page up and Windows page down, which is slightly like not particularly well chosen because a lot of keyboards don't have a page up and page down keyboard on on laptops. But generally on laptops, if you press function up and down, you get the same thing. So this is basically Windows function up and down, um, and then. You know, there's move a window to a different workspace. It's, you know, quite good. And so if you just add shift to it, it moves the window. So yeah, it's a case of like knowing what the things are called and that they exist, and then you can search for them. It, I haven't found a lot of good, like, here's how to productively work in a graphical windowing environment in 2022 kind of material. That's, it probably must exist somewhere, but I haven't found it. That's what defeated me when I got a Mac Air myself. I just couldn't figure out how to use it in a way that yeah. felt comfortable to me, and I couldn't find the, the information in an yeah. easy to follow way. And I guess uh, one observation that I have here is uh, when when you talk to somebody who's just starting to learn to program or starting to do machine learning, they always ask the, that question: which is the one programming language I should learn? And you know, or which is the one uh, library that I should learn? And people spend two weeks trying to answer this question, uh, where you know, in reality, it is just start with something, anything, uh, ideally something that is geared towards people starting out. But uh, you know, if you do hang around that field, you will learn a lot of libraries. That, that, that's just the nature of it. You might have one that you prefer, but you know, you will try various things out and maybe it's the same thing with operating systems. You know, for, for uh, part of my life, I have been thinking I have to, you know, just uh, focus on this uh, single operating system and make it my home. And at first it was Ubuntu, and then it was uh, Windows uh, through no uh, small influence of Jeremy, but maybe it is uh, sort of, yeah, you know, if you are a computer user, and you will be comp a computer user for next uh, X amount of years. Maybe it makes sense to invest some time actually to, you know, try different things. And uh, it's also that if you probably uh, attempt to use a Mac, you might become a better Windows user or Ubuntu desktop user. I think just that's because true. of Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's like using multiple programming languages, I think is a good idea. Um, and just trying to be good at each of them. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, okay, oh, I see people putting stuff in the chat. All right, Wasim and Marty, I know you guys can both talk, so you can actually <laughs> say it. Uh, Marty asked what Mac I got. I just got a, um, well, I've, the one I'm on right now is a Mac Mini M1. I just bought it um, a couple of months ago for, for testing fast AI releases, honestly. Um, but then once I plugged it in, I figured I should try using it. Um, and then the laptop I got was uh, just the uh, MacBook Air M2 512 gig drive. Um, <clears throat> Just sorry, on the basis. Uh, yeah, sorry, go on. Oh, I was just I was changing topic. Sorry, I put a little uh, link to a um, handy vocabulary dialogue thing that I've been using over the weekend that I found helpful as well. In the Thank chat. You. I will. Share. This one? Yeah, so it kind of gives That's you your monadic uh, versus didactic um, names. Those link to the documentations, um, tells you kind of what they are too. So I've, I've found it helpful. Great. Yeah, looks sweet. Some of these I don't recognize. And that's where the double alphas and double omegas. Or yeah, so we'll talk about from. this in a moment. Uh, and then so, Wasim also yeah. shared this one. Oh, so I also used Windows for a long time, and I don't now I use Mac. I don't use most of the like gestures and the way that they expect you to do things, I think. But I just keep like one window with lots of, or one virtual desktop with lots of windows. And then alt tab between them and use rectangle to like send windows to like the top left or the left or whatever. Mm. It was quite cool. Thanks for the tip. Um, one which I didn't immediately uh, find, but once I found it, it helped was um, um, command tab or windows tab switches between applications. Um, but to switch between windows within applications, it's uh, command backtick, which is not something you would necessarily find by mistake. That's quite helpful. I'm using a Microsoft keyboard, so I still have a Windows key. I'll try to remember to call it command. Yeah, I always try and have my screens maximized so I can switch between windows and I'm yeah. terrible at sticking to that rule. Yeah. Um, oh, and then other news. Um, oh, uh, yeah, so these um, ugly blank lines we have in our, um, in our page um, are caused by, um, this, which is actually added by the APL dialog kernel. So I contacted them and told them that they shouldn't be adding forced styling into the elements because it's then impossible for us to make it look good. Uh, so then I made it, it look worse by accidentally out. putting line breaks in the middle of them too. So yeah. that's why they look even bigger. But. Yeah. So yeah, they're going to try and fix it. If they can't, then we could use MB process, create a processor to delete this. But um, he said he's going to check it out next week. So that was nice of him. Um, and then the other weird thing that happened was um, our actual study group got on the front page of Hacker News. So that was weird. Um, uh, a lot of APL stuff seems to get on the front page of Hacker News for reasons I don't understand. Uh, <laughs> So is anybody here actually from the Hacker News thread? I, uh, oh, mainly people I recognize, I think, so. Yeah, yeah a lot of FASTI stuff also often gets on Hacker News, which is good, I guess. <laughs> yeah. That's fine. They I'll start reading it. Terrible comments, but um, 
nice for people to know what we're doing. Uh, yeah, I thought this was an interesting question of like, how the hell do you actually do multi-line editing? So Isaac kindly linked the section of the book, which is um, in the GUI, there's basically, you can use this close parenthesis ed to open up the editor. Um, and then something I haven't tried apparently is you can use square bracket d input, which I guess lets you put a multi-line, is that what this does? I think so. Uh, you probably, yeah. I, I don't know if that's the only thing what it does. I haven't really looked at the documentation, but yeah, you can copy that directly in your I mean, you don't need dialogue it in the REPL. Because it's weird that they um, say we define it in the notebook. But anyway, yeah, okay. I mean, you, yeah, you can put that sense. directly in the REPL and it'll, it'll work. And then the other thing I just wanted to kind of show off about is um, the, we now have hyperlinks in our APL notebook, which goes to the documentation. And we actually get those for free, thanks to Isaac um, porting this over to be an NB process repo, which is what NB devs gonna be called very soon. And then, um, now who did it? Somebody then, uh, added the NB dev index to it. Where would I find that? I'd have to search. Should be from the last lesson. Ah, uh, okay. That's weird. I thought I... Categories. Array programming. Search. Yes, last lesson. Quite right, Serata, thank you. Um, so NB process slash NB dev um, has uh, uses this thing called NB dev dash index, which basically creates PyPy um, uh, uh, modules such as NB dev NumPy, for example, which if you pip install this, basically you automatically, it will automatically hyperlink every NumPy keyword to its documentation. And so um, so Johan kindly added an APL index, which he um, manually created, or well, semi-manually, um, just using Python requests. Um, so yeah, so now thanks to the magic of nicely decoupled APIs, uh, it automatically just worked. So we now have hyperlinked study notes, which I think is very fun. All right, um, let's talk about operators. Ah, yes, we were first gonna talk about Decorators. So um, let's create a function. Add one. Okay, and so we're going to pass it of something to add one to. Okay, so there's our function. Now, um, let's create another function, which we'll call uh, log args. And this is a function which is going to take a function. And it's going to return another function. And the function it returns will be one that calls this function, but prints the arguments it gets first. Um, so to start with, let's do something really ridiculously easy, which is just to return the function it's passed. So we could create something called g, which equals log args of add one. And so log args is going to be passed this function, 
and this return it. And so G will be exactly the same thing as add one. Make sense so far? Okay. So um, we could define a function inside a function. Um, which is going to take some arguments and some keyword arguments. And it will simply pass them along to F. So now when I call log args, it's going to create a new function called underscore inner, or actually called like, well, yeah, we'll call it underscore inner. Um, and that function will return f, so it depends what we pass to it. So this is going to do exactly the same thing as before. Okay. Um, but then what we could do is say print received args, 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 args. So now we could do things other than just running the function. Oh, I didn't actually say G, that was my mistake. Okay. And so you can see now it's done the same thing that the function did before, but it's doing something else as well. Does that make sense so far? So this is a function which takes a function and returns a function. And so people often seem to call these higher order functions, which I find confusing. Um, or not particularly helpful because they're just functions, but there you go. Um, so there's a special um, uh, way of doing this. So if I wanted to create a logged version of add, add one, I would have to do two steps. I'd have to first create add one and then call, say, you know, create this new version of it and then call that new version. Um, so Python has a special syntax for doing these two steps. And that special syntax is to, oopsie daisy, is to put at, this is a special syntax. And so this syntax, when you put at and a function before the definition of a function, is it's, is it's going to take the function that's called, which is defined here, it's going to pass it to this function, and it's going to replace this with whatever gets returned from it. So this is exactly the same as what I did before. So if I now go add one, make sense? So I can now add logging to any function I want to, such as my world changing mult2 function. Does that make sense? Um, This is slightly by the by, but um, something that you can do is um, you don't have to use a function. It just has to be something that's callable. Something that's callable is something that you can put round brackets after. Um, so let's say we wanted to change this to with uh, that we wanted to be able to change this this here to some other prefix. So you can do that with a function, but you can actually just do a class. So we could create replace this with a class, right? Um, and then we could. So not many people seem to know this is possible. Hi. Put something in the, this is somewhat related, but I put something in the chat that um, I learned something about F strings that uh, allow you to actually uh, shorten the F string a little bit and get the same thing. Which I found about today. This was only added in a somewhat recent Python, but I don't remember which version it was. Um, Maybe you can try and figure it I out. Think Python 3.7 onwards. 3.7. Okay, well, 3.7 is. Oh is 
uh, 3.6 is EOL, so that means you can safely use this now. I had not been using it because I knew that until at least until recently, there were in supported versions that didn't support this. But yeah, okay, that's great. That now exists. So let's use it here. And then there's a question from Alev, I think. Hang on, let me do this and then I'll take a look. Thanks for letting me know. Okay, so we should be able to do this. Oops, oh, that's right, I was halfway through fixing this. Okay, let's try that. Okay, yep, so that works. And there's a question from somebody. So I can read it out. What does the convention of starting function name with underscore signify? Oh yeah. Um, when we start a function name with an underscore, it's um, it generally means it's private. It generally means it's not something we expect people to be calling from from outside of this place. In NB Dev, um, things that start with underscore are by default not exported, so they don't appear in Dunder all. Um, Starting and ending with two underscores is a special Python thing, which means it's what the it's it's a magic method. It's a magic that will automatically be called um, um, at the uh, at, at some time by by Python. So, for example, done to init is automatically called when it's created. Um, so, if I was to turn this into a, a class. Um, Then it's um, so we're going to say let's let's say uh, we're going to call it the prefix, which we could default to received, like so. And so then we could go self dot prefix equals prefix. Okay, so this is now a class which um, knows what prefix it is. Okay, and then. Um, when you call it, so if you, um, so just to explain, if you have, there's a, there's a very interesting magic method called done call. Which does this, dot prefix. It basically makes your class callable. So if I create an instance of it, then I can call it. Um, put X in here. So you see, I'm treating it as a function. And so when you treat a class as a function, this is what it calls. Um, so then we could um, use this, instead of passing x, we're gonna kind of pass some function. And um, Keep all that stuff. Oops, uh, except for that one. And so now, rather than putting received here, we would put self dot prefix. Okay. So when you call this now as a function, you're going to pass it a function, and it's going to return a function. Um, which means we would now write, for example, logging, for example, like this. 
Okay, so this is calling a, the function or the callable log args, which is a function. Oh, sorry, which this is sorry, which is a class. Uh, so this instantiates the class passing in this prefix, and so <clears throat> so this gets replaced with an object of this class. So if we have a look at add one. Um, This, this class then gets called being passed the function add one. And so it then gets replaced with this. And that's why we end up with a log args dot dunder call dot underscore inner. Um, anywho, so, um, so yeah, so higher order functions are functions that take functions and return functions. And uh, Python has some um, tricky fun stuff. Hi, Jeremy. Yes. Okay, hi. So I just wanted to say uh, something uh, for, for people who are seeing this for the very first time, uh, decorators. So the, I have a tip. The tip is to just use them anywhere. So. Uh, when you uh, start thinking about these inner things, when you are first introduced to it, uh, you would be confused. But if you just use it, you can use it on, uh, there are a lot of uh, these in Flask framework. So in the Python Flask framework, there are a lot of uh, decorators being used. And in, and you can also uh, see this in like Python as LRU cache, LRU cache for uh, ca you know, caching older variables. Uh, so if you just start using it, then you will not be confused very much. So Excellent. always, sure. whenever you see a decorator, don't start thinking what is going on inside. Just use it. Um, so um, here's the here's the long-handed way of doing this. Well, I guess the long-handed way actually would be to define would be to call this something else, like underscore add one, and then this could be called add one. And so here's a version which doesn't use decorators. But it behaves the same way. Um, oops, this should be underscore add one. There we go. Okay. So in APL, um, functions that take a function and return a function aren't called functions, they're called operators. Um, and you will find, therefore, if we look up the language elements, which elements? Oh, I should have looked at dialogue, dialogue language elements. There's separated out, okay? There's a table of functions and there's a table of operators. So as you can see, dot, which Isaac told us about, means in a product. Um, it's an operator because that returns a function which does matrix multiply. So I think we should start with some simpler, um, simpler versions. But first of all, Let's clean this up a little bit. Okay, so then we've got this version. Okay, and then we've got this version. And this version. And I guess we should have the manual version of this one as well, which would be to say define underscore add one x um, x plus one. Oh, uh, sorry, define 
underscore malt2, turn x times 2, and then it's say malt2 equals log args of underscore malt2. So here's the version without a decorator. And it does the same thing. OK. So now let's look at APL and show you everybody's favorite operator, which is slash. And this one here appears to be in the wrong spot. Why is Oyota here? I guess we didn't know where to put it, maybe. I don't know why it's here. Let's move it. There. Oh, I see why. It's because we had strings. So maybe we should move strings before all that. Okay. Oh no, that's got row in it. Man, this stuff's so complicated, isn't it? Fine. Leave it here for now. So operators, we do have a few more Boolean things to go, but we can always come back to them later. Operators. Slash. All right, so let's do slash. It's called, this is an operator, reduce, called slash. So we've got to have monadic slash called reduce. All right, so here is oh, and we need to turn on our APL thing. Go. Okay, so let's say A is out of five. I wonder if I can do this. Um, uh, quad is like no. Pick L. Oh, it's an L. Thanks. Okay. Plus slash. A. All right. So. Um, Here's A, and here's plus slash A. Now notice here that slash is not a function. It's an operator, and therefore it has different rules. The first rule to know about operators is that they bind more tightly than functions. So normally if, the, if slash was, a, was behaving as a function here, then this would happen first. 
but because slash can behave as an operator and there's a function on its left, this happens first. So operators bind more tightly than functions. So, so this is parsed as plus slash first. Okay, so then what does plus slash do? Well, slash is an operator, and so therefore it, um, it returns, plus slash returns a function. And what does that function do? It takes a function, uh, so it's going to, here it is here, f slash, so it takes a function. The function has to be dyadic. And what it does is it applies the function between items of the vectors that it is passed. And so literally what this does is it inserts the symbol plus between one and two and between two and three and between three and four and between four and five. So you get one plus two plus three plus four plus five. So therefore plus slash means sum. And here is the sum of the numbers from one to five. So this is the same as capital sigma in math. Now, when you say it does it one plus two plus three plus four plus five, but isn't the order from right to left? It is. Or how does that work? It is. Yep. Yeah. So it it so it inserts it between it inserts it in between these pairs. So it becomes one plus two plus three plus four plus five. And then to evaluate it, it would do this first, four plus five, and then this three plus nine. Okay. This two plus twelve. Yep. Yeah. Um, so we could do the same thing with times. And this is now the same as capital pi in math. It's the product. Um, so yeah, this is called um, a reduction in computer science. A reduction is something that basically reduces the number of dimensions, <clears throat> um, not necessarily down to a scalar, but if you start with a vector, it would reduce it down to a scalar, as is happening here. Um, and there's a very similar one, which does exactly the same thing but it shows you everything that it does along the way. From left to right. So, um, so now that I think about this backslash version, I wonder if maybe it doesn't work the way I just said it to Tanishk. Maybe it always, maybe slash is doing it left to right as well. Um, the left to right thing is about how it um, parses a statement like this or an expression. Um, um, but I guess evaluating a reduction, maybe it is actually evaluating left to right. I mean, neither of these cases does it matter. Hey, let's test. Let's do divide. Bit, bit of a weird one, but um, why not? Um, let's just make this three. Um, uh, you slash covered it slash? Oh, whoops, that's strange. Divide slash, thank you. Uh, let's see, one divided by two is a half, and a half divided by three. Okay, no, it is doing it right to left. So two divided by three is two thirds, and then the reciprocal of that is one half. Okay, so it's definitely going right to left. So backslash must just reverse the order as well. Oh, wait, what? Wasn't it three divided by two and then divided by one to get 1.5? It's, uh, it's doing two divided by three to get two over three, and then one divided by that to get three over two. Because this is the same as one divided by two divided by three. Hmm be the same as one divided by two divided by three, which is the same as one divided by two divided by three. Okay, so um, I guess backslash is not quite working in either of the ways I thought. Um, I think what it's doing is it's printing out 
need all these spaces. I just I think it's just printing out each of these. It's doing that. Um, oh, so it's kind of like a cumulative function. It's kind of cumulative, but it's not, right? Because this last one actually is doing it right to left. So it's not really cumulative all right. at all. So I think it is doing uh, every line. So uh, like yes. every two numbers and one more and they print it. Uh, yeah, it's doing, it's doing every line independently. Um, so it's not necessarily going to be as efficient as I thought. So we could see that hopefully in the docs. Okay, it's called scan, which is a common computer science term for this idea. It's formed by successive reductions. It doesn't really explain exactly how it's done it, but we can see from the divide example how it must be doing it. So there's this reduce thing happening, but I also recall from functional programming, reduce with memo. Is there such a thing? Um, like, is it just uh, memoization? Reduce? So no, no, like w w when you start with an initial value. Oh, um, with an initial value. So there's not really any need for that here because you can always just insert the initial value. This is the first um, element, right? Yeah, I think um, we haven't covered this yet, but I think we might be able to use like comma for that. Yeah, so comma concatenates. So you could always just put like comma with your first value here. Sweet, thank you. All right. Um, One way I've seen these this uh, reduce um, work as well is if you combine it with equals or eventually like min or max or whatever, you can kind of look for um, either the minimum or the maximum or or see if the entire array is, is yes, absolutely a, not not a unique value. Uh, so we actually haven't done. done min and max yet, but I think that's a great idea to put them before this. Um, so min and max. And are they going to have monadic versions? They do, actually, I'm pretty sure. OK, so I never really remember which way around they are, but there's s and there's d. Okay. So S is this one, and it's called something style, up style, I think. Yeah, up style. OK, so up style. OK, so the monadic version is slightly less relevant. It's called ceiling. So that's just a, a roundup thing? Yep, just a roundup thing. So it's normally called ceiling and floor in both programming languages. It's um, uh, finding the nearest integer that's <coughs> greater than or equal to the number. And D, I assume, is called down style. Is and therefore 
this one it's going to be called floor, I assume. And so there's a good, you know, kind of mnemonic for these, right? This is, you can see, this is going up to the ceiling, this is going down to the floor. Um, so you can see this one's being rounded down to the nearest integer. Okay, so apropos of um, um, Isaac's point, the dyadic ones are interesting when we reduce them because dyadic, I assume this will be called min and max, yep, maximum. returns the greater than of two things. Now notice here that even though I don't have a space, this is the list of the array, three, two, maximum, the array two, three. So that'll be element wise, always element wise. That's the maximum of three and two will be the first element. And the maximum of two and three will be the second element. Um, and then, yeah, where it gets pretty interesting is what if we um, create a um, print it out? Done random numbers yet? Something like that. Um, actually, let's just do a few of them. Four, six, two. So four, six, two. So that's going to pass it first of all as maximum of six and two, which is six, and then maximum of six and four, which is six. And so where that gets interesting is we can then reduce slash like so, reduce slash. I get the same thing. Does that make sense? Because that's literally going to insert the operator between each pair of elements. So that is the same as that. Does that make sense? So I think that's really quite great. Another thing that I, I, I've, I've found helpful with the upscale and down style is you can do like four and then one of the styles and then an array and it will kind of set your own custom minimal or maximum value, kind of a cut off an array. So right, right, right. So we could do a four random. style, three, four, five. We could oh, do a exactly. value operator, right? So we could do um, yeah, let's do that. Okay, so let's do negative four. Negative four, six, two. And so then um, we could do that. And that's going to do a ReLU operator because it, it's truncating negatives to zero. Is that what you meant, Isaac? Like that? Yeah, that's exactly what I meant. Excellent. One glyph activation. Yes, exactly. Just how really should be expressed. The there's rectified a, linear unit. There's actually a paper I found somewhere, which was APL NN convolutional neural. I think they actually have a, a GitHub repository with um, their code as well. It didn't make all lot sense to me, but hopefully one day it will. Yeah, here. This is all of the from scratch implementations of layers of a ConvNet, oh. or at least the types that were common in 2019. Just need the uh, backwards, uh, the, the, the I think calculation backwards, no, backwards is here, I think. Um, and so for convolutions, they actually had this version here, although when I read a bit further, they said that there are, there is an easier way to do convolutions. CNN building blocks, convolution. Um, 
That's a really good oh, This is they said you can do something like this apparently. Anyway, I guess we'll get there. Um, I'll put this in the chat if anybody wants to add it to our session notes. Chat, chat, chat. Where's my chat button? Oh, I've got it popped out. Oh, and I can put the link to the GitHub repository if you want to look at great. more of their code too. That'd be great. Oh, and Kurian mentioned that the um, that the little that that f string trick with the uh, um, equals in it is actually only from Python three point eight. So that probably best not to use it just yet. Decorators. I see. CNN. Neural networks. Ah, and this is the Rodrigo who I was chatting to about dialogue kernel. Very cool. Actually, um, looking at that, uh, and we realized, have we covered the lamp cliff yet? I don't think so. Um, wouldn't be a bad thing to include quite early on, because otherwise it's just going to be confusing, isn't it? Um, actually, hang on. First of all, let me fix, just get this sorted out. Dyadic. So in terms of getting the D and the S, the, the minimum and the maximum the right way around, the fact that this is D for down style is actually quite helpful. That's a character for that one. Um, wait, what happened to the... Oh, this ReLU thing. Okay, we've got it in the wrong spot because this is not a slash. So I should put this up here. Okay, so what character, what uh, what keyboard is uh, the um, comment lamp thing? Uh, the back tick comma. Comma. Okay. Back tick comma. Is a comment and present. Is a comment under code. Great. All right. Seems like a good place to stop. So we now know about operators. And I guess maybe next time we can try making our own operators. Or we'll try doing a derivative operator, which yeah. means we're going to have to do alpha, alpha, and omega, omega. Cool. Cool. All right. Thanks, all. See you next Thank time. You. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.